But we're going to be looking together tonight at the late Middle Ages, uh, 900 to 1415. And uh, the, the theme of this time period is really the, continue, the continued challenge uh, in the Western Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and how it laid the foundation for the Protestant Reformation. So let me give a proviso uh, about this. Oh, uh, do we have any more notes? Yes, we'll, we'll get you a few more. Anybody else need some notes? All right. All right. Got them? All right, okay. Um, in setting up the, the, the context for the emergence of the Protestant Reformation, and we're going to talk about that next week, um, I'm going to point out the things uh, in the Roman Catholic Church that began to go wrong. Uh, I'm going to work not to sound pejorative against Roman Catholicism uh, 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 that comes off as being overly mean or critical or, or judgmental. Um, and, so, and, I, I, and so let me say this, just so there's no confusion about it. I believe a Roman Catholic person can, can uh, find Jesus and trust Christ and, and get saved. Okay. Uh, I do believe there are things in the Roman Catholic Church that, that uh, uh, can obscure the truth of salvation in, in Christ alone, by faith alone. And that whole um, uh, recovery of justification by faith alone really defines the Protestant Reformation. So just hear both of those things. Uh, I, I uh, um, want to tell you the history. I don't want it to come off as being mean or mean-spirited. but. In my opinion, it is the history. Also, I'm doing the history of the Roman Catholic Church as a Protestant, all right? So my view uh, is I'm in protest, you know? So that's, uh, there's a little bit of that as well, but just hear my heart in all of that uh, as we look at this, this time period together. And what I want you to see is uh, in the late Middle Ages, there were especially a series of doctrines that would emerge uh, in the church. And, and the other thing, we, we'll talk about the Roman Catholic Church, but it's really the only church. That's the only church that people can go to if they live anywhere west of Constantinople. And so that's just, that's just the church, the only church that there was. And there were some doctrines that emerged during the late Middle Ages uh, that, that were that those who called for reform, those who protested, uh, they would be protesting specifically against some of these doctrines that we're going to go over uh, together tonight. And the, the fundamental problem with all of these doctrines that we're going to look at together tonight is that they elevate human effort and human merit in the process of being saved. Uh, increasingly, the, the net effect of the doctrines were there are these things that you do, and if you do them, you'll be saved, and if you don't do them, you won't be saved. And the result is something that, that Luther identified as works righteousness. Works righteousness. And that's really the protest uh, that will emerge uh, ultimately, most successfully with Martin Luther, uh, of moving from works righteousness uh, to righteousness through faith in, in Christ alone. So that's, that's uh, going to be uh, what we look at together tonight. And so you see that, uh, that line there, confusing Christ's work. So are we saved by Christ's work or are we saved by our work? Are we saved by what Christ has done or are we saved by what we do? Now, let me say this. There's always been a tension between faith and works, right? Uh, what does James say about faith and works in the, in the New Testament? Faith without works is dead. Okay? Uh, don't just talk. Don't just, don't just uh, 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 have it all be about what you say. Don't just be hearers of the word, but doers of it also. All right? And then you have uh, that Pauline emphasis that... Um, uh, uh, in uh, Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you are saved through and, and uh, not by works, right? Okay, so it's about as clear as you can get, except James will say, you show me by faith, show me your faith by what you do. All right, so there is this tension between what God does and what our response is. And that's been a 2,000 year long debate. Um, and there's a sense of ultimate mystery about it where we want to say we are saved by faith alone and yet what we do in response and in faith does matter. 
And so the church has always been trying to work through those things. But uh, what we're going to see in the history of the Roman Catholic Church is that increasingly the, the center of gravity of that uh, tilted more and more to, and more to what a person need, needs to do. Uh, the, the, the activity and the action of the, of the person rather than in the work of Christ. So there's confusion about Christ's work, and we're going to look at some of the things that, that cause that confusion. First is sacramental theology and just a sacramental view of the world. There's an increasing emphasis on the sacraments that will result uh, in the late part of the Middle Ages in the seven sacraments. Um, and so here's... Here's what that sacramental theology is about. Um, uh, what is the relationship between the spiritual and the material? What is the relationship between the spiritual and material? Where does God's world and our world touch, and what's the nature of that interaction? Now, is that a good question? What's the relationship between the spiritual world and the, and the created world? Is that a good question? Well, sure it is. It's, it's one of the most important questions. How, how, does, how do we connect with the things of God? How do we connect with God Himself? And so, um, the church begin to use the resources of Greek philosophy to answer that question. And so they use, especially in the Middle, middle Ages, Aristotelianism. And what Aristotelianism uh, wanted to say is that, is that spiritual things or ultimate realities are, are actually inside of created things. Um, uh, your, your big word today is hylomorphism. It's the, it's the idea that the, that, uh, the, the eternal nature of tables is present in that table. That's what makes the table a table. Its tableness is inside the table. Everybody follow what I'm talking about? Okay. Now I know you hear that and you think that, what, what are you even talking about? That's a pre, what, what do we say a table is made out of? Well, atoms quarks or leptons or plastic or, or whatever. Uh, we have a much more materialistic view of things. There's, there's no eternal reality inside of that table. Now, is that true that there's no eternal reality inside of that table right there? Would that table be there naturally occurring? No. The truth is there are non-material realities that are, m have much more to do with that table sitting there than atoms and quarks and leptons, right? We just tend, modern people just tend to denigrate eternal things because we like to focus on, on, on what's material, all right? So ancient people, pre-modern people were trying to work through because they didn't know about quarks and leptons and, and subatomic particles and th that sort of thing. They were free to think more about, well, what are, the, what, are the, uh, uh, what are the realities that hold things together? Why, does a, 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 why do things take a shape and, be, and are able to hold it? And they thought that had something to do with spiritual reality. So the church did a bunch of thinking about that and um, increasingly uh, and, and it, so it sort of became a little bit like a game of telephone. Y'all know what the game telephone is? A conversation starts one way and then it winds up over here and it almost has nothing to do with how it started. Alright, so here's the process for the church. So the church begins to think about well, wh where does the Bible say most specifically that heaven and earth touched? Jesus In Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. So, so we know our starting point is, is that humanity and divinity come together in Jesus. Heaven and earth come together. The, 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 the created uh, and the creator come together in Jesus in one place. And the word that the church liked to talk about from the Bible was mystery. It's a mystery. It's a, that's especially Paul's word. It's a mystery. And in the New Testament and, and in the Greek, a mystery is something that's been hidden and now has been revealed. And so when they talked about mystery, they didn't only mean the part that we didn't understand. But what makes a good mystery book good? Good ending. The good ending. That dun dun dun. You know, and I don't know why that is the tune, tone that's always played, but that's what they play. And the 
missing piece of the puzzle comes in, that missing piece of evidence comes in, and it pulls all the pieces and parts together, and everybody's like, yes, mystery solved. And so when Paul used the word mystery, that's what he meant. This thing that's been hidden that we didn't understand and couldn't figure out, finally is, we, we've got the key, and the key is Jesus. It's where heaven and earth come together. And so the Greeks used mystery. And so as the church, then the Greek church starts to think in the first couple of centuries after Christ, they like that word mystery and they're talking about that, that the spiritual and the material come together in Jesus. And they say, well, it isn't just Jesus where the spiritual and material, but it's the whole history of Jesus. In fact, in some ways, it's the whole biblical story is a, is a mystery revealed. And so, so not only is Jesus, but Jesus is life. And then Jesus' mom. And then uh, the other stories in the Bible are, are, are uh, mysteries and uh, are places where the material, the, the spiritual and the material come together. And then they say, well, if the Bible stories are mysteries like Christ, then the church is a mystery like Christ. It's also a place where heaven and earth come together. Well, some of the things the church does, that baptism, boy, that baptism especially, that's a place where heaven and earth come together for a believer. They're in that water, and it's just, it's ordinary water, but then it, what does that water also kind of represent? The grave and the death, and, and that picture is the death and re resurrection of Christ. So that baptism, that's also a mystery. That's also a, a, a place where heaven and earth come together or where the material and the spiritual come together. Well, not just baptism, but also the Lord's Supper. Well, that's a place where uh, you're holding something, you know, in your hand, a piece of bread, but also we realize that something supernatural is coming in on that. And then they thought more and more and more about how those... Um, uh, and, oh, and then the language changed from mystery to sacrament. So sacramentum is a Latin word for the Greek word mysterion. And so sacrament, but as things moved westward, it became more and more technical, more and more uh, specific, and they, they sort of were trying to almost dissect the idea, well, how is it that a piece of bread at the same time as the body of Christ? And if that's what happens, that the piece of bread, a piece of bread can contain the body of Christ, well, well, that would be pretty important to have access to. If you could ha actually eat Jesus' flesh, drink Jesus' blood. And so that bread now has pulled down a supernatural presence into it, and then you take it into yourself. Well, that's a, that's a pretty important thing to do. And it became more and more sacramental. And then it better became a sacramental view of the church. And here's the other thing I want you to catch on to. And now y'all stay with me because I feel like I'm losing you. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to make this not so nerdy. <laughs> so the church is the place where heaven and earth comes together. So the church is the place you need to go for the things where heaven and earth come together because you're going to need some of these things where heaven and earth come together, right? In fact, through Augustine, the church is the only place you can go. And so they started to use language like the church is sort of the receptacle for the merits of Christ. More the Protestant view is Jesus died and, and gives us grace and he gives it directly to clay. Okay? Clay can get directly the merits of Christ by faith. Well, increasingly what the Roman church is, said is, well, Jesus died and he gave his merits to the church. And it's the church's job to give out the grace. It's the church's job to give out the grace. And the way the church can give out the grace is the sacraments. And so the, priest, the priests can do it because they're almost sacraments themselves. And then the, and then the sacraments themselves, these are, this is the delivery system for the sacraments. And so you've got to come here and get them. And then a Protestant belief is that, is that the work of Christ that gives us grace that when grace is given to Clay from Christ, Jesus doesn't give it on the installment plan. How much grace does Clay give when he accepts? He gives it all of it at once. But increasingly the view of the Roman Catholic Church, because you had to live your whole life, is you get the grace in installments. You get it in installments. And you get it mainly in installments through the sacraments. You take the, you take the Eucharist, you're baptized, and it was the seven sacraments. Baptism, Eucharist, 
uh, confirmation, marriage, ordination, extreme unction or, or anointing. Which one am I missing? Confession. confession. Very penance. Penance or confession, right? And by the end of the Middle Ages, it was those, those were the seven sacraments. These are the seven ways that you, that these are the seven means of grace. And you have to come to the church, you have to come to a priest to get them. That weightedness towards the, almost the material, that, that the way to get the grace of God into your actual material life is through the sacraments only, it's, it just continued to drift the weightiness in that direction. So it didn't matter about the character of the person giving the sacraments, and it didn't really matter about the character of the person receiving the sacraments. Ex opera operato is the, is, goes back to Augustine. It's the, the doing and the benefit of the sacrament is inside of the sacrament itself. It's not so much based on the character of the priest. It's not so much based on the character <laughs> of the recipient, it's based on the what's inside of the sacrament. And when you go to the church and you take the sacrament, you have received grace. All right? We can all see how that sacramentalism then can become very mechanistic. I go to church and I take these things and I have the salvation, or at least I have salvation uh, I have a little bit of salvation. And so we see how that can turn into work, works righteousness. Then scholasticism is the next uh, mark of, of late medievalism and you ever heard people talk about uh, theology nerds trying to determine how many angels can fit on the head of a pen anybody ever heard well that's the joke from the late middle ages all right it's this scholasticism in this western roman spirit is um, a, 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 an emphasis on rational justification for religious belief. We're going to explain everything. And so we're going to take the faith and just break it down into all of its component parts. And we're going to get it, we're going to, we're going to define what is the soul and what's the soul made out of and how does the soul move? And when a sacrament hits a soul, how does the soul move back? And it just got very technical and very specific. Uh, uh, in, in, in many ways, it was abstruse. It got further and further away from ordinary people. It got further and further welded with, with uh, uh, philosophies, and it got further and further away from the Bible. So just this ever-growing mountain of theological detail that was really to be left to the experts. And what ordinary people really need to worry about is just making sure you get to Mass, get the sacraments, and try to be a good person, and you'll probably be okay. And that, that, that was the uh, effect of scholasticism. And that if you mastered the right understanding, you've mastered salvation. And so the life of faith became increasingly about the mastery of subject matter rather than a vibrant personal relationship with the living God. <clears throat> The third uh, area that moved towards this confusion about Christ's work is the papacy, all right? Um, uh, since the early centuries, there had been a rise in importance. We learned this last week about the rise of the importance of bishops. Increasingly, people were ceding uh, their decision-making to the bishops. It was going to be the bishops who figured out uh, what we believe and what the rules are going to be. And so the, the uh, level of bishops had, had uh, increased um, and by 1000 A.D., Rome's bishop uh, took on a completely different feel and increasingly was viewed, as we learned last week, as the, as the first among equals of the, of the bishops of the, of the large cities of the Roman Empire. In the 8th century, there was a forgery, and this is widely, the, the, the consensus is that the do, uh, donation of Constantine was a forgery. It was put forth as something that Emperor Constantine had written. Uh, but it was actually written uh, in the 8th century, not in the 4th century when, uh, when Constantine lived. And this donation of Constantine decreed that the Pope was the universal bishop. The, I'm sorry, that the, that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the universal bishop that he's the teacher, preserver, the godfather of the emperor, the vicar through whom St. Peter displayed his power, and the supreme temporal lord of the West. 
Now, if I stood up next Sunday and said this about me, you might go, hmm, uh, Eric's off his meds, you know, or we need to get, get him looked at. This was a, would be way different uh, uh, level of authority and power uh, than, uh, than was typically understood of a, of a leader in the church. Um, it would go on to say, and inasmuch, uh, this is a quote from the, from the donation of Constantine, and inasmuch as our imperial power is earthly, we've decreed uh, that it shall venerate and honor his most holy Roman church and that of the sacred sea, that's, the, that's where the Pope is, of the blessed Peter shall be gloriously exalted above our empire and our earthly throne. We attribute to him the power and the glorious dignity and strength and honor of the empire, and we ordain and decree that he shall have rule as, as well over the four principal seas, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, Jerusalem, uh, as also over all the churches of God in all the world. And the pontiff who for the time being presides over that most holy Roman church shall be the highest chief of all priests in the whole world, and according to his decision shall all matters be settled, which shall be taken in hand uh, for the service of God and the confirmation of the faith of Christians. That elevates the Pope, uh, the Bishop of Rome, to a level of almost absolute authority rivaling the authority of Scripture. So, for instance, when the Pope speaks ex cathedra from, from his seat, uh, he speaks with great authority, unquestioned authority. Well, as you can imagine, there, there are some dangerous downsides to that. Uh, over the end of the 12th and end of the 13th centuries, Pope Innocent III, uh, he is really the most consequential pope probably in the history of, of the papacy, but certainly uh, in the history of this time period. He greatly expanded the power. He took this donation of Constantine that was written in the 8th century and really began to apply it uh, in his papacy. And so he moved himself from being the vicar of Peter to the vicar of Christ. What does that mean? That he stands in for Christ himself. Uh, that he is Christ's representative on the earth. Here's a quote from him. We are, this, we are the successor of Peter, the prince of the apostles, but we are not his vicar, nor are we the vicar of any man or any apostle. We are the vicar of Jesus Christ himself. And he's even using we to talk about himself, kind of a royal we there. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has established one sovereign, the Pope, over all, his universal, uh, over all as his universal vicar, whom all things in heaven and earth and hell should obey, even as they bow the knee to Christ. They should obey me in the same way that they bow their knee to Christ. A very strong increase in the power and influence of the Pope. Innocent called the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 to declare the Pope to be ruler of all Christendom and the first official, and he also uh, defined transubstantiation, which is the Catholic view of, of, of um, the Eucharist. We'll talk about that in a second. Be and what do we know about absolute power? Absolute it corrupts absolutely. And so in the centuries after uh, Pope Innocent, uh, it was a time of tremendous worldliness uh, and corruption, uh, and it would mark the papacy for centuries. Way too close to an association between earthly rule uh, and the rule of the church. A great politi politicization of the church uh, and um, buying and selling really of, of, of anything and everything. Uh, there, there wasn't anything you couldn't do uh, to get what you wanted out of the church if you had the right amount of money. Boniface uh, the, the, the Eighth was known for taking bribes, uh, using his powers to co coerce rulers into submitting their authority. In some ways it was just payola. Um, you pay him and he declares you to be the duke over here or to be the, you know, the ruler over here and, and you pay the right amount of money and then you get the check mark from him. Clement V, uh, in 1305 from 1314, he was appointed uh, to be the Pope in Rome, but he was French and he was heavily allied with the, with, the, with the French rulers. And so he actually moved the papacy to Avignon. And for seven popes, the Pope never lived in Rome. He lived in Avignon, France. Uh, and as you can imagine, he was, he was uh, preferred the French and preferred to rule uh, and to do things that favored the French uh, there in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it was a time period called the ba Babylonian captivity of the papacy because there were, at times there were two popes uh, and certainly there were two places from which the pope ruled.
So the, the, the uh, elevation of, of the power of the Pope, how do you think that played into uh, this, this uh, tilting towards works righteousness? Give a man control, you get man control, you get human being. Say that louder. Give a man control. Yeah. So, so you just get the role of power, human power and human influence. Anything else? You, you just get someone who now has the authority to give a, a fairly significant revision to the doctrine of salvation and can, can come in and influence that. And what's a good way to, if increasingly the church began to monetize its sacraments, what, what, are, what are you gonna get? Not only can you buy a priestly area of service, you can buy a ministry, you can buy a, a bishop's post, but what else can you buy? You buy salvation itself, all right? Uh, we'll get to that. The next area is of, of, of change is Mariology. All right, Mariology is the doctrine of the Virgin Mary. Uh, increasingly, the church began to venerate and elevate Mary at, uh, at, uh, at one point. Uh, in this time period, she is called the Mediatrix. The Mediatrix, meaning uh, or, or emphasizing her role as a mediator between mankind and God. Well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good... Um, Promotion, uh, that you are a mediator between um, man, well, let me make that specific. She's a mediator between mankind and Christ. And so there's this sense, and this, this sounds pejorative, and I'm, I'm trying to find just the right words, but if you didn't want to talk to Jesus, you could talk to Mary, and Mary would talk to Jesus. Sort of the, sort of the idea in that, that Jesus is now the pen the ruler of all things, and now is the coming judge. And so if you want to talk to somebody nice, you talk to Mary. She's the nice one, all right? And that's the one you, and she represents you and cares for you before, uh, before Christ. Um, um, this emphasis on Mary began as a, a good faith attempt to really protect the transcendence of God. And so do y'all remember, uh, this would have been in the early uh, centuries during the ecumenical councils, uh, the, the um, controversy over whether Mary should be called the God-bearer or the Christ-bearer. You remember that? Theotokos or Christotokos? Come on. Yeah, of course you don't remember. Who, why would anybody remember that? Um, Understanding Mary is important because you have to understand how, uh, because it's, it relates to the, the nature of the incarnation. And so you need to understand Mary correctly and what's going on with her because she's playing a role in Christ's incarnation. Agreed, all right? So that's why, that's why we still affirm the virgin birth and the virginity of Mary, right? She, she's, a, she's important. And the church was trying to get that figured out. But in, in trying to get that carefully defined, they went with the phrase, God-bearer. Mary is the God-bearer. Well, that's a... So, so you're the one who gave birth to God. Any, anytime that's the thought, then that, that, that's, that makes you vulnerable uh, to, to perhaps a, an improper elevation of your status. Uh, and so uh, in, in this desire to preserve the two natures of Christ, that He's fully human and fully divine, we've got to understand Mary properly. But here's, here's what that resulted in. Uh, were, the, were ultimately what are known as the four doctrines of Mariology. These are the four crucial doctrines of Mariology. You've probably heard of them. One, that she is the mother of God. And so you'll, uh, you'll queen of heaven. You'll, the big Catholic church in the town where I grew up, it was, it was a queen of heaven church. And so she's the mother of God. Secondly, her perpetual virginity, that not only was Mary a virgin, uh, when uh, Jesus was uh, conceived, but she remained a virgin forever. So her perpetual virginity. Uh, thirdly, it was Immaculate Conception, and this is really in the 1800s. Uh, they finally officially recognize it, but, uh, and understand this, because sometimes we Protestants get this wrong. Who was immaculately conceived? Mary was immaculately conceived. 
and I thought this too until I looked it up, uh, Immaculate Conception is not talking about Jesus' conception. It's talking about Mary's conception, that when Mary was conceived, she was free from the stain of original sin. And that's the way Roman Catholics then are enabled for Jesus' humanity to be free from original sin is that Mary was free from original sin. So Immaculate Conception refers to Mary, not Jesus. And then finally, and this was in 1950, the Assumption of Mary. Uh, it doesn't mean that Mary was good at assuming things. Uh, it means that Mary went directly to heaven, like Enoch or Elijah. She just went, she just, she did not die, uh, but she went uh, straight up uh, to heaven. So, um, and so what you get in all of this is someone uh, else to pray to. Uh, you, uh, during, the, uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, what crystallizes is the, uh, the Hail Mary, the Ave Maria. And so praying to Mary uh, and, and praying that, um, th that Mary would take care of us. There was some, someone other than Jesus to go to for help. Someone other than Jesus to go to for uh, mediation. And it also demonstrated the, uh, the church's authority to generate new doctrine. Because what's the biggest challenge that you see on these doctrines of Mary? James. Sure, you got, you've got that doctrinal challenge. Well, right, right. You, you, you know, how, how does she have these other children, that sort of thing? There's no scriptural basis for any of these doctrines. Uh, there are at best maybe some, some inferences, but there's really no scriptural basis for these. I certainly think for the assumption of Mary, that sort of thing. But it shows the, the, the popes and the bishops' power to generate additional doctrines uh, that, that sit alongside but are not derived from Scripture. And if you can generate that kind of doctrine, what else can you generate? <laughs> anything you want, right? Just any, anything you want. So, um, where am I at? Yeah. So, uh, some examples of Mariology from a guy named Odo of Cluny. Uh, Odo of Cluny in 900 from a sermon. He says, Through St. Mary the Virgin, who is the only hope of the world, the gates of paradise have been opened to us and the curse of Eve has been canceled. Peter Damien, an 11th century monk, wrote uh, of Mary's prayer causing Christ to look favorably upon us. So you get Mary to pray for you. Then that's what's in the, uh, the Hail Mary. Uh, pray for us sinners now and at the time of our... Our what? I just went away. I death. <laughs> Should have thought of that. Um, uh, by, so by thy pious prayer, make thy son propitious to us. That's what we, that's what we pray to Mary. Bernard of Clairvaux, 12th century uh, monk, preached during an Advent sermon, Our Lady, our Mediatrix, our Advocate, reconcile us to thy son. Commend us. Uh, to thy son. Represent us to thy son. Do this, O blessed one, through the grace that thou hast founded, through the prerogative that thou hast merited, through the mercy to which thou hast given birth. Um, uh, and so no, no longer is there one mediator between God and man, but there's now another mediator. Uh, and um, that uh, uh, is, a, is another uh, departure uh, from, the, from the biblical sense of, of salvation. And Mariology today, so this is from the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church today. She's taken up into heaven. She did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. So, uh, and I think if you, if you are Roman Catholic or you are familiar with Roman Catholic Church, Mary is still very extremely important to, to, to Catholics, to Roman Catholics. And to uh, Eastern Orthodox and that all from that tradition. Uh, the next uh, challenge, the next confusion concerning Christ's work is penance. Um, penance arises around uh, out of this idea concerning bat what should happen after baptism. Um, there was this idea that started to grow around the time of Augustine, and probably before that, that baptism wiped away original sin. So baptism would wash away original sin. Uh, and all the sins committed up to the point of baptism. 
But over the centuries, uh, through the early Middle Ages, and really, really from very early times in, in the church, infant baptism began to be practiced because the high infant mortality rate and the concern that a baby would die still possessing original sin, uh, uh, bab babies began to be baptized. But, but then you create another problem. If you've had your original sin wiped away, well, what about all the sins after you get baptized? What do you do about those sins? Um, how are those consequences covered? How is the sinner restored and cleansed? Which is a good question. It's a New Testament question. But for the Roman Catholic Church, penance would be the main answer to this question of how do I deal with my ongoing sin. Penance is doing certain acts as a restorative punishment for sins. What started as a means of restoring wrongs committed, penance began to increasingly take on redemptive context weighted uh, by eternal merit uh, more than temporal restoration. Um, I do these things and, I, and my sins are are atoned for. Uh, they're expiated. Even that word of expiation is used. So some examples of penance. Boniface uh, in the 700s wrote a sermon. Penance became the second form of cleansing after the sacrament of baptism. So that the evils we do after the washing of baptism may be healed by the medicines of penance. The evils we do are healed by the medicines of penance. Uh, its place in the life of, 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 the, of the Catholic Church was solidified. It became one of seven sacraments, which is a means of giving grace. Uh, and so today in the Catholic Church, um, from their catechism, raised up from sin, the sinner must still recover his full spiritual health by doing, some, by doing something more to make amends for the sin. He must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins. That's, that's strong uh, theological language. This satisfaction is also called penance. Um, Mary diminishes Jesus' role as mediator. Penance limits, it effectively limits the, the effectiveness of Jesus' work on our behalf. You, you now have to do something. Um, the Bible does teach repentance. It does teach a sanctified life, Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3 speak about taking off the old man and putting on the new man. I mean, you, you tell me, you who are sitting out here tonight, uh, after you get saved, can you just do whatever you want? Well, don't you believe in grace? Don't you believe in faith alone? All right? Uh, we know that, the, that there is the challenge of how do we continue to walk in victory and freedom from sin. Um, but, I, but what's the Protestant answer, because we believe it's the gospel answer to the sa sanctified life. You can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your joy. Yeah, right. Okay, there are consequences uh, uh, when we are not walking in obedience. And what, what do we do when we find ourselves under conviction? Right. We, it begins with a recognition, I can't do anything. Just like I couldn't do anything about becoming a Christian, I can't do anything now about how badly I've goofed everything up and we cry out for help. And, and then what else? Because that, that's, there's more. Uh, the Bible talks about more. What, what, what do you do in response to your, when you recognize you've sinned and repent? What does repent mean? Okay, and how does one repent? All right, admitting you're wrong, agreeing with God that, that you've done, done. And, and so then you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and start to do better. Well, okay, then, then what do you do? Right, we, we still know that, that walking in newness of life is still going to be a Jesus thing. It's going to be a Holy Spirit thing. Uh, we're going to need the constant help of Christ. We know that our response and our obedience is in there. It's a necessary aspect of that. And so it doesn't mean we don't have anything to do, but it's leveraged on the work of Christ for us. It's always the same power that is, is at work. Uh, and it's the power of Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. Um, and then purgatory. Purgatory would be another doctrinal development that, that continues this trend towards work righteousness. Purgatory is an intermediate stage between earth and heaven uh, where we are purged from our sins. In 254, uh, Pope Innocent... Uh, I don't think 254 is right. Get rid of that. Uh, Pope Innocent I, in an official letter, 
uh, wrote this, the souls of those who die after receiving penance, but without having had time to complete it, or who die without mortal sin, but guilty of venial sins, or minor faults, are purged after death, and may be helped by the suffrages of the church. For in this temporary fire, sins, not of course crimes and capital errors, which could not previously have been forgiven through penance, but slight and minor sins are purged. If they have not been forgiven during existence, they weigh down the soul after death. All right? So purgatory is this um, non-eternal hell where you go to be purged. That's where but purgatory talks about purging. And it's this place you go for your unforgiven but not mortal sins. So does anybody know the difference between mortal sins and menial sins? All right. The mortal sins, if you die with a mortal sin unforgiven, what happens to you? You go to forever hell. All right. So how do you get a mortal sin forgiven? You have to go to confession. Right? Uh, and be absolved by the priest. It's called absolution. That's a, that's a part of the, of the sacrament of confession. Um, and so, but if you pass away and you only have venial sins, venial or non-mortal sins, that, 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 that are the sins that if you die with venial sins, they don't send you to hell. Those sins have to be purged uh, post-mortem. So um, this became the official Roman Catholic uh, conciliar doctrine at the Second Council of Lyon in 1274. Um, the Council of Florence in 1439 con added this, that congregants and priests can pray for the dead who may be in purgatory. So it adds this element uh, that, um, uh, that the dead can be prayed out of purgatory. Uh, here's a quote. If the truly penitent die in the love of God before they have made satisfaction by worthy fruits of, of penance for their sins of commission and omission, their souls are purified by purgatorial pains after death. And that for relief from these pains, they are benefited by the suffrages of the faithful in this life. That is, uh, the masses, prayers, and almsgiving, and the other offices of piety usually performed by the faithful for one another according to the practice uh, of the church. And so, in the same way that fellow believers could minister to one another in, the, in this life, fellow believers could also minister to one another post-mortem. And they could do so uh, through, their, uh, through their prayers. Like Mariology and Penance, uh, this again um, is noteworthy because of its lack of the work of Christ. So, if somebody is in purgatory suffering, what is going to be the solution to their sin and their suffering? Well, it isn't Jesus, okay? It's going to be the work and the activity of something other than Jesus. Uh, purgatory today is still the official uh, view of the Roman Catholic Church uh, from their catechism. All who die in God's grace and friendship, but still, imperfect, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. They're, they're, their sinfulness has to be uh, expurgated before they are able to go uh, into God's presence. Yes, sir. Could they also be bought out? Well, we'll get to that. Okay. Yes, yes, there's more. Um, and probably the most noteworthy thing about purgatory is that they're really, you're hard pressed for any scriptural support for purgatory. Uh, it, it really is the production whole cloth of of uh, the Roman Catholic magisterium. So then we get to indulgences. Indulgence is just the next step. Um, and indulgence pays some of the punishment for specific sins. The idea is that the church can apply some of the excesses, some of the excess merits of Christ and the saints to the recipients. This is called the treasury of merit. So let me give you the definition of the treasury of merit. The treasury of merit is made up of both the merit of Christ and the merit of the saints. When, when I began this lecture tonight, this idea that, 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 the, that the church is the storehouse of merit. It's the storehouse of the merit of Christ, the storehouse of the merit of the saints, to distribute as it will. Okay? So uh, the saints 
live lives of such sanctity that they accrue more merit than they need for themselves. They're so good that even if they'd done many less good things, they still would have been able to go to heaven, which again is works righteousness. Um, uh, works done above and beyond the call of duty. Thus the surplus merits of the saints are added to the merits of Christ and may be drawn from the treasury of merit uh, to those who receive indulgences. So that's, that's, that's how indulgences work. Rome offered indulgences for the living and the dead. It's the logical development of, of penance. Um, and it was connected to monks. During the, uh, when the monasteries grew up, uh, monks would pray, because they were really good prayers, uh, and they could pray uh, that God would release people from purgatory. And so that monks praying and, and probably being paid to pray for, pray people out of purgatory, uh, was welded to, to that idea of the surplus availability of the merits of saints uh, and of Christ and, uh, and monetized. And so... Um, uh, and and uh, during the Crusades, indulgences were, were offered as payment for participating in the Crusades. Um, this would really, we'll learn this next week, this really becomes the inflection point for the Protestant Reformation. That's just a bridge too far. Because how might indulgences be abused? If you can buy them. <clears throat> It just became a money, so we'll learn about a, 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 a monk named Tunsil. Uh, Tunsil was in Germany, and he was a pennant, he was a indulgent salesman, and they worked off quota systems, and he was a rainmaker, and was known as quoting, a, 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 by the time your money in my coffer rings, another soul from purgatory springs. You know, bang, and 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 it was a um, well. Think about you, your loved ones. Think about how you feel about people you know who who've gone on, and if the authoritative spiritual leaders for you said you could do something about that, if you were and had a doctrine that that really, and this is what you need, need to know. Um, the view is that very, 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 very few Christians died and went to heaven. Nearly all Christians died and, died and go to purgatory. And I think that's still essentially the case. I had a, a priest who was a friend um, uh, in Mississippi. And when I asked him, are you going to go to heaven when you die? He says, and he's a priest. He's a priest who was a priest in the, in, the, in the church down the road from me. And he says, I don't know. I don't think so. I said, really? So don't you believe in justification by faith? He says, yeah, I do. But it's justification on the installment plan. And so it'll kind of depend on how all that shakes out. But I'll, I'll be spending some time in purgatory, you know, for sure. And then if I goof something up worse than that, it could be, it could be even, even worse for me. So that's, again, that's real different from how uh, we view it as, as Protestants. So another area uh, where you had this, this drift is transubstantiation. This is the under, oh, yes, sir. How do they get feedback that somebody got out of purgatory? <laughs> yeah, that's the, that they don't. They don't. Right, right. Do what now? Logically, it all just sounds good. Th that's right. And so, but what, so I don't want to unnecessarily uh, overstate uh, or or uh, lay the problem to, to um, ignorance or, or people being ignorant. Uh, there was only one church and over several centuries power had crystallized into that leadership. I mean, these people held the keys to the kingdom. Is there evidence that those that wrote these new rules actually believed that what they were doing? Was I think a generous view is that they did. I, I, if you tell someone over a long period of time that they have a unique and direct line to God and that they have a responsibility for speaking for God and you surround them with people who say that and they go to sleep and have a dream or they're 
kind of daydreaming or thinking and praying and, and something pops into their head, they, they can segue into thinking that's from the Lord. Uh, we are, but that's the, that's the problem with having human beings like me and you given that power because some, uh, have you ever had the experience of not really knowing all the things that were motivating your behavior? <laughs> right? uh, uh, look, honey, I bought you a brand new chainsaw for your birthday. I, I thought you would love it. You may not have noticed that what's the real motivation? I wanted a chainsaw. Uh, you know, or you uh, want to quit your job and have your wife run a tree service. Um, and so it's very possible that they just didn't pay attention to the fact that this also uh, could be a, a real uh, money generator. Yes, sir. I was just going to make a comment that I think that back in, when that was happening, they were very naive because they didn't. They kept the word of God away from them. Yeah. And so they were able to influence based on they don't have the knowledge, so let's do this. And therefore, people just listened and it sounded good and they influenced them in a way that they believed that until Luther came around, right. who challenged that because he did read the Word. He read the Word in the New Testament and basically said, no, this is not right. Yeah. We got to you know, change things. Yeah, so remember, it's a great point. We're, we're going to get to that too because here's the, here's, we'll, we'll get to the key to the Protestant Reformation. Who, how much Bible reading is going on during this time period? None. Zero. If a town had a Bible, that's how you should think of it. There might be one Bible in your town. And the priests have it. And they don't want you, you little dirty little uh, surf hands, touching that Bible. And why wouldn't they have bothered letting you have it anyway? Because you can't read it. You can't read it because you can't read, or you can't read it because you can't read Latin, which is the only version that the Bible comes in. And so the, nobody had a book. There were no books. There were no books. And so the fact that the people didn't know very much about the Bible, you have to have the book to be able to know very much about it. By golly, you Baptists have your Bibles, and sometimes y'all surprise me about how little y'all know about the Bible, you know? The truth be told, so uh, it's hard to know all of those things. And so um, uh, they did not have that biblical background, uh, and it was not, it was not a thing uh, to make that kind of, of information available. Yes, sir? And, and one more key, and, and one other thing we can apply today, they were told, don't think. It's not your job. You don't need to know. I got you covered. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. Some people were lazy. They didn't think. They had no, no motivation, if you will. Well, and, and, and I'll give that a, 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 maybe a little different veneer. Imagine the life of a serf in northern Germany in 1300. What were you mainly up to? Trying not to starve. Okay? You didn't have time. There was, there was, and there was, again, because of that, no tradition of thinking. There, there wasn't. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a life of the mind. There wasn't sitting by the fire at the end of the day with your, your smoking jacket and your pipe reflecting. Okay? It was just, man, it was grinding out the days. Life expectancy was 40. You just, that's not what people did. They did what they were told. Uh, because life, what life was like that. So you see, I, I, that's why I want us to keep, keep a lot of that in mind, is in, in many ways these things are the product of the times uh, that they were in. These were, these were different, uh, different times. Anyway, so I'll keep going. So quickly, transubstantiation then. Uh, Jesus' body and blood are truly contained in the sacrament of the altar under the forms of bread and wine. The bread being changed, trans, transubstantiation, by the power into the body and the, and the wine into the blood. Uh, during the medieval period especially, they were so concerned about not wasting any of the body and blood, the flesh and blood of Christ, they got to where they wouldn't let the people drink. They didn't get to have the cup. They withheld the cup. Only the priest 
drank the cup as something called communion of one kind. Uh, and by the 1400s, the people no longer were allowed to, to drink the wine. They could only have uh, the bread. But this belief that I can, in, I can actually ingest grace very much de, de faiths. You just go and you get the grace. You just, you just go to that grace outlet and get some grace. And it covers you until the next time you need grace. And then if you die before the next time you get to get some of the grace, you'll go to purgatory, get that burned off, or somebody will pay that off, and you'll go on to heaven. And this is how it sort of mechanizes, essentially mechanizes the process of getting saved. So uh, this is the situation. In the Middle Ages, these practices... Uh, uh, become more uniformly Rome's theology by the end of the medieval period with one thing in common, human merit. It's, it's you do. You do these things and you'll get salvation in installments. Uh, we cooperate with God to receive His grace. Salvation is a very cooperative process. Yes, Christ died and He gave us grace, but you got to do things to get the grace from the church. Yes, sir. Do Roman Catholics today still believe that you can... Um buy somebody out of purgatory? I don't know. I'll find that out and report back to you. That practice, it was, uh, there was the Council of Trent that happened after the Protestant Reformation in which serious reforms, they weren't serious enough for Protestants, but they were serious reforms. And I believe that prob probably the practice of indulgences was done away with or greatly restricted. There's still a relationship between money being given and prayers and, and that sort of thing, but, but I'll get back to you on that. I think it was greatly modified because even the Roman Catholic Church acknowledged it had gotten, it had gotten way out of control. So, all of this... Oh, yes, sir? Are Roman Catholics encouraged to read the Bible today? I don't know the answer to that question either. I, um, I would... I don't, I'll find out and I'll get back to you. Any, can anybody speak to that? Yeah, they have, they have Bible studies now. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. The priests don't have Bible studies. Okay. Wednesday night or after Mass on Sunday. Yeah. And, and, Bible or the Catholic Bible. Yeah. Um, Vatican II, this is, this is where I start to, I, I need to refresh, get, get a refresher, but Vatican II was also, a, and that was uh, Pope John Paul II was a, probably the most significant kind of updating. And uh, you know, up to that point, uh, uh, mass was still done in Latin. You know? And so here's a crazy innovation. Let's do church in the language that people speak. <laughs> you know? So ooh, that's, a, that's, that's a, a, quite an innovation. Yes, sir? I know with, uh, with the outcome of The Chosen and people like Matt Walsh, they talk about um, an app called Hallow. Yeah. That's, that's kind of Catholic related, I think. Um, yes. Not very on right. Uh, right. Yes. I, I, I'm going to say there's, uh, there has been a trend since the 1950s uh, in the Catholic Church to, uh, to modernize some things and to make Scripture more available. But, but let me get to that story because those, those are all good thoughts. Um, all this crystallized, I want to give you a little, I've been waiting to give you a little bit of this Latin because I think it's some of the most important. It, it, it sums up so well sort of where we are at the end of the medieval period when, the, when, when Protestant reform launches. Um, uh, faciente quod in seis Deus non denegat gratiam. Got that? Uh, uh, facere quod in seis. Um, to the one who does what is within him, God is obligated to give his grace. To the one who does what is in him, God is obligated to give grace. That fundamentally is this idea that you start and then God's obligated to respond. And the way to facier quote in say est is through these sacraments. It really had come down to do one or more of these seven things and you do it and then God's obligated to give you grace. And that's just, that's where it wound up. That's why I like to use the, the phone call. I don't think anybody started with that idea in mind. But they, but they got unmoored from the Scripture 
and began to stack in, and it's this long set of magisterium over centuries, and it just, it's just like painting. Any of you uh, strip and, uh, a piece of furniture and you find out it had eight layers of paint on it? Well, that's a job, right? To get through all of those layers down to the original wood. It's just, you understand how there can be this accretion over time and there's a pretty big gap between what it's become and what it used to be. But the seeds of reform start. So uh, John Wycliffe, you've ever heard of the Wy Wycliffe Bible translators? Uh, John Wycliffe is in uh, England at 16. He's in Oxford in 1346. When the Black Plague hits in 1347, it just, it just changed him, uh, uh, awakened uh, his um, interest in ministry, and his, he just started to think differently. And he started to write against the abuses of the papacy, uh, these misbehaviors and the political stuff and the corruption. Um, what do you think is the response if you start to write and criticize the papacy? That's a good way to get killed. And um, he argued, and he started to argue, the Pope has no authority over the English government or the church. And he leveled this critique from his reading of Scripture. Because he's in the, because he's in the, in the ministry, because he's been to college, he's learned to read, and he's learned to read the Bible, and here's what happens when you start to read the Bible. Wait a second. I don't, where, where's the verse in support of that? And so he starts to level these critiques from reading Scripture. And what this leads him to understand is, wait a second, the Scripture is above the Pope. The Scripture is the most authoritative. That's and everything else flows from that and not the other way around. The Scripture is superior over every other human word, most notably that of the Pope. Here's what, uh, here's what Wycliffe says. It's impossible for any part of Holy Scripture to be wrong. In Holy Scripture is all the truth. And so he is the one who initiates the ambitious work of translating the Bible into English, not from the Greek and Hebrew, and we're not that far along yet, but from the Latin Vulgate. Um, so that's the Latin translation of the Greek and Hebrew. Uh, and he completed this in the 1380s. There was massive opposition to this uh, from the church officials at the time. In 1408, the Archbishop of, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, Thomas Arundel, uh, in, a, in a work called The Constitutions of Oxford said, We therefore decree and ordain that no man hereafter by his own authority translate any text of Scripture into English or any other tongue and that no man can read any such book in part or whole. We don't want anybody translating the Scriptures and we don't want anybody reading Scriptures that have been translated. What did they know if that started to happen? <laughs> the whole thing is going to have to be revised if that starts to happen. And it's the priest's job to, to communicate uh, the truth of Scripture to people and no one else's. Um, uh, those who were associated with Wycliffe or followed his teachings were called the Lollards, L-O-L-L-A-R-D-S, and they se faced severe persecution. A hundred years after Wycliffe in 1519 at Coventry, England, seven Lollards were burned for teaching their, burned at the stake, for teaching their children the Lord's Prayer in English. Mm. Not only could you not read it in English, you didn't need to recite it in English. You needed to be able to say, Pater Noster Quiest in Kylie, Sanctificator Nomen Tua, Mod Winiat Regnum Tua, and Piat Voluntas Tua, Sequit in Kylo et in Terra. That's the, that's the Latin for the first part of the, of the Lord's Prayer. Instead of being able to say it in English, our Father who art in heaven, you had to say it in Latin, or don't say it at all or be burned at the stake. Um, uh, and then not only did uh, Wycliffe start to call for not only the authority of Scripture, but that everybody should have uh, access to the Scripture in their own language. Those things are revolutionary. And then his view of justification. Wycliffe um, wrote, Trust wholly in Christ, rely together altogether on His sufferings, Beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by His righteousness. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation, and that without faith is impossible to please God. That the merit of Christ is able by itself to redeem all mankind from hell, and that this sufficiency uh, is to be understood without any other cause occurring. This is revolutionary. This is revolutionary. 
that you're justified by faith alone, not needing any other, um, any other sacraments. Um, and so uh, Wycliffe is nicknamed the morning star of the Reformation. He elevated scripture. He taught justification. He uh, attacked the authority of the, of the Pope. Uh, and he translated the Bible uh, into English. And then John Huss is another one of these forerunners to the Reformation, 1372 to 1415. Uh, he's in Prague. That's going to be the Czech Republic now. Um, uh, in 1411, he attacked indulgences. And so they're really beginning to see the misuse and, and abuse of indulgences, uh, calling them useless since God himself freely forgave all who truly repent of their sins. And so he is just... And it has a little bit of this feel of the emperor without any clothes. He's just the one who finally speaks up and says, is it just me or does this seem like not real? <laughs> like something concocted as a money-making scheme. Um, here's what he writes. The church uh, 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 was the entire body of, of the elect from all ages known to God on the basis of God's free gift of grace. It has one head, Christ, not the Pope. Huss pointed out that numerous error, that pointed out the numerous errors of the Pope. He challenged his authority. Um, he said that preaching, not the Eucharist, is the central uh, act of ordained ministry. So this is another revolutionary thing, that the, that the preached word is the center of worship, not the celebration of the Eucharist. And so that the elevation of the preached word and that it, it's really the central sacrament uh, is, is the word of God. The Council of Constance was called in 1414 and Huss was invited to come to defend himself. He, was, he knew that he was taking his life in his hands if he went and did that, but was granted safe passage by the emperor of the time. When he got there, the council ignored the order from the emperor not to hurt Huss. And so they bring him in, knock him around, strip off his, his, uh, his priestly garments, um, commit his soul to the devil. His response to that was, and I commit myself to the most gracious Lord Jesus. They burned him on the stake on July the 6th, 1415. He refused a last minute pardon and said, I shall die with joy today in the faith of the gospel which I have preached. So he was martyred uh, for his stance on justification by faith uh, and on, the, the, um, on challenging the, the authority of the Pope. This created an uproar in Bohemia. So here's something else that's going on is as the Holy Roman Empire fragments, uh, there's a lot more um, national identity. So this was known as Bohemia at the time, and the Bohemians didn't like one of their countrymen being treated that way. And there was some revolt, there was some violence, and really for the next hundred years, the Bohemians and the, uh, and the Holy Roman Empire would be at odds with each other. And this can, would continue to be the case that um, you could find geographical protection from the authorities in Rome. And so the conclusion is this. Uh, 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 what happens by the end of the Middle Ages is that, is that uh, there, was a, there was a shift towards works righteousness. There was a longing for Scripture. Uh, there is uh, some technological innovations that are coming together uh, so that Scripture can be um, in the hands of ordinary people. And once again, I, I think we've, we've touched on this. We think on this side of history that everybody would have said, oh, I want my own copy of the Bible. Right? Duh. It just wasn't a thing. You didn't know not, you didn't know you didn't have it. Nobody had it. And you might even be afraid to have it. You hardly even knew what was in it. You wouldn't have assumed. You would know how to understand it. And so you were glad to have someone else tell you what to do and to tell you what it meant and to, and to not question it. And, but some things are coming together. We did not talk about this tonight, but next week we'll talk about Renaissance because it's the other thing that starts to happen is, is uh, Renaissance lays the foundation for uh, Reformation. And one of the things that it does is it begins to create critical copies of the Greek and Hebrew that can be translated into modern languages. And so you get the Greek and Hebrew first, 
and then we'll talk about this, but Luther then translates a good and a, 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 a solid critical edition of the original languages, and he translates it in, not even into highfalutin German, but he translates it into common German. And man, when people got God's word in their language, and then what, what's the other big piece of technological innovation? Gutenberg's, Gutenberg's printing press. And I tell you, I did a little research, because this is free, because I'm in it, in it a little early. There is very, very little history of Gutenberg or the invention of, of the actual de I, I thought there'd be like this big book, like on Tuesday, Gutenberg hammered out the letter A, you know, just something, you know, there's really, we know it was Gutenberg and we know it was his business, but nobody put it in a book, <laughs> I guess, of, of, of how it was invented and how he figured it out. Because that's, because you did, yeah, you use his old noodle, very good, but he, there wasn't one of these things. And um, so we won't know, and I guess until we go to heaven, what the, what, what the, um, what led to it. But you got to believe, here's my, here's a little theory. And they, oh, they had been doing engraving, so they knew, they have known for probably a couple of centuries, you could, you could carve a picture in reverse and dip it in ink and then stick it on paper and it would, right, y'all know how that works. But you would think immediately somebody would do habits, you do that with A, B, C, D and switch them around and you can make a printing press. And you just, we think, I mean really it took us 1,500 years after Christ to make them. Everybody wasn't going to school like we all in the real, like somebody has some money or somebody all the people that's on the little 14 acre farm like trying to he was, a, he was a little bit educated and then he had a background in metallurgy, and so there's a little sense they knew how to work with metal. But here's my point, and I'll be quiet about it. Like some other innovations, it's very, it's very likely that it's just a flash of insight. It's just a flash of insight. Probably with metal work, probably with these engravings. Because it takes a little bit, to, because you, with printing, you gotta think it uh, and kind of upside down and backwards, is how it goes and that you would want to make individual letters and, and bunches of them so you can, you, can, you can set the type. I think he just, all of a sudden he thought, wait a second, and wow, for everyone to have a copy of the Bible, it just changed everything. It changed everything. And so, I'll, and I'll spend a little more time on this next week as well. Don't take your Bible for granted. You know, y'all probably, each of us has 10 apiece. It's a miracle that you have it. Lots of people still don't have one. And uh, it's an incredible blessing. If you have a copy of God's Word that belongs to you. Yes, sir? So if the Catholics now do have a Bible. Mm -hmm. So if I approach the Catholic and we had a discussion and I begin to bring up some of the fallacies in their faith, how would they respond? Well, I, I think I, I, here's here's the here's the way that I that I would go about it, and this is really this is probably the best thing to do with anyone who has a strong religious background. Is how about we study the Bible together? Let's just let's just uh, let's just because a Catholic has a very high view of the Scriptures. They just, there's, there's, there's a more comfort level at letting a priest teach some of that, but they believe, they believe the Bible's true. And so let's study it together and, and, and maybe ask questions and, you know, how do you work out the, you know, show me that, you know, I'm kind of seeing y'all do a lot of emphasis on Mary. Why don't you show me some of those Mary verses you got there? Or, or uh, I think that's, I think that's better uh, uh, than maybe starting out with a, let me tell you the 50 things that, you are totally wrong about, you know. But are they aware that they're fallacies? Now that I, that I don't know. I mean, here's, here's, oh, there's, go ahead. There's a um, program on the radio that you go to, it's called Catholic Answers, it's on every day, but anyway, people of all denominations call in and ask these uh, apologists, Catholic apologists, different questions. And it's all about that. But most of the questions they're going to answer are going to come out of what Dr. Hankins 
um, the catechism. And most Catholics, if they know about the catechism, when you ask them a question, they're going to go to the catechism and look it up. Because there's so many things they're not going to know. Yeah. They'll go tell you, i got to go talk to the priest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, a, that's also a good reminder. Uh, in Roman Catholicism, they don't view the, the, uh, the catechism stuff is sometimes widely just referred to as the magisterium. It's just all of the church's teaching. They're not going to say that they regard that to be the same as the Bible, but it's functionally the same as the Bible. And so when they go to the catechism and say, oh, it says it right here. Now, the problem with us is what's our response going to be to that? It's not the Bible. That's not, that's not you know, that's not in the Bible. And that becomes some of the, you know, that, that's going to be a tension point. Yes, sir? Does that include the, the Apocrypha and stuff like that? No, now, the, the, the Catholic Bible includes the Apocrypha. That's a great question. Um, and those are the... Those are the books that were written between the time period of the Old and the, and the New Testament. Frankly, the Apocrypha is not just jam-packed with interesting doctrinal stuff. It's history of the Maccabean Wars, and it has some you know, things like that. The Magisterium is really going to be all the church's teaching since the New Testament closed. And so it's going to be what Athanasius said and what... Cyril said and what Augustine said and then they'll glean out of that and decide these are the things that are you know almost as authoritative as the Apostle Paul and that'll all be listed of course the magisterium because it's been and it's still growing has been growing for 2000 years so it's huge and that's the other thing about scholasticism it says this idea is there's always an answer You're like let me go ask my priest well they they can dig through reams and reams and reams of, of data and, and find an authoritative answer uh, that, that backs up uh, uh, something in their practice that we would have a problem with because we don't see it in the Bible. And so it really comes in some ways down to that issue. Uh, uh, the five solas. Sola is Latin for alone. And that really display the heart of the Protestant Reformation, sola. We believe in sola scriptura. What is that? Scripture, scripture alone. Sola fide. Faith alone. Faith alone. Sola gratia. Grace, Grace alone. Uh, uh, sola uh, Christus. In Christ alone. So it's grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Uh, scripture alone. Uh, um, what's the fifth sola? Soli Deo Gloria. Did somebody get Soli Gleo? Bam! Soli Deo Gloria for the glory of God alone. Very good. But that, and, and the first sola is Sola Scriptura. The Bible alone. And that's probably a better answer, Dennis, to your question is that's going to be the issue. Do you believe that the, that the Bible is the foundational central authority alone for Christian faith and if their answer is no then that makes the discussion pretty tough and it may be hey well let's talk about what we can be dead certain the Bible says um, anyway those are those are good questions yes sir I just wanted to add you said don't get complacent with your Bible I guarantee you most of us do get complacent mm -hmm. Until you go into a Middle East country where you cannot take your Bible, mm -hmm. then you'll find out how much that means to mm -hmm. you. Yes, yeah. My parents were in uh, Moscow just after the fall of the Soviet Union. So this would have been 91. And they're in a place that the Bibles have been gone for two, two plus generations. And so they're in Red Square. And they got a box of Bibles that they're going to hand out. And the word got out that there were Bibles. And my parents and the handful of others that they were there with, my, my, my mother said, it's the only time I got scared, not because people were going to hurt me, but because there was this crush to get a Bible. And they really started to press in on them.
press them up against a wall because they were they were and they were crying kissing the Bible weeping overwhelmed they could not believe it and they were in Russian uh, and in another place there was some, somewhere else in Moscow didn't have the same crowding experience but uh, they were handing out Bibles and a uh, Soviet soldier with the that long coat you know and the sickle and hammer you know and he walks up to my mom and and uh, he kind of looks around and he kind of just bumps her with his elbow never looks at her and mom holds out a Bible and he takes it and slips it into his coat and never says anything but to and mom says that was her experience of being somewhere where you get killed for having a Bible and there wasn't any available and how it was it was the most important thing they'd ever put their hands on so we need to remember that as well well let me pray for y'all thank you uh, for being here and next week you've been so great and we're, we'll get to the we'll get to Luther and Protestant Reformation and all that that stuff and um, uh, and uh, we've paddled our way out of the Middle Ages so congr congratulations Father thank you for um, again for meeting us here thank you for uh, uh, the, the fact that you uh, have given us great grace through your son Jesus Christ Lord we do have a story to tell and we have a word uh, to preach because uh, you provided us your word and we do want to be uh, careful and grateful stewards of it Lord uh, help us to again to take up this great heritage that you put in our hands and a heritage that has come to us through the blood of the martyrs through men and women who were willing to give their lives and, and not just give their lives but be tortured drowned burned uh, horribly treated uh, um, but regarded the truth of the gospel as more valuable in it than even their lives uh, uh, Lord we're grateful for that Help us to be sure that we have the same kind of commitment through your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen.